Well, if I had any sense, I'd just take the standing ovation and leave. <laughs> I was in a panic. Those of you who could see my back bending over there, someone gave me a clicker, and then I couldn't find it anymore, and I thought I'd dug, thrown it in my purse or one of those beautiful bags or somewhere. So I was in clicker panic, but it's here, so we're all set. Thank you so very much, Bishop Susan, for the wonderful welcome. Um, I can't tell you how much it honors me that you would consider me a mentor, because I know you are that for so many in this room and, and others, and including myself, so thank you. Uh, one thing that I have said many times to the Lutheran Church, and I'll, I'll touch on it again unless I forget in the presentation, extraordinary the engagement of this church when in a way, legally speaking, you didn't have to. Uh, you're not one of the parties to the settlement agreement, and yet you are a collective of people of faith and of citizens. And so you've understood what the spirit of reconciliation in our, in our uh, mandate talks about. So I want to begin by <coughs> acknowledging that we are on the traditional territories of the Treaty Six Nations and how grateful I am to be here. And I also want to acknowledge not only your own leadership, and uh, the governance of your own church who have worked very hard to prepare this huge national meeting. But I also want to acknowledge in our midst any survivors who may be with us, and I know there's at least one, um, and any intergenerational survivors who may be with us today because you are the ones who have shown the leadership that has brought us to this topic and to this subject matter and to this opportunity to discuss together today. When I say I know there's at least one, I want to acknowledge also the presence of my husband here. Susan's already mentioned him, the Honorable Stephen Kakwi, who is both the former National Chief of the Dene Nation, but also former Premier of the Northwest Territories. And in the context of this story, a residential school survivor also. And on that front, one of the now thousands of teachers that I have had. And so um, I'll be introducing him, at least calling him up uh, to share with you in a particular way over the course of my own presentation. And then perhaps if there's time for the discussion in the end, I could ask him to come and stand with me in case any of your questions uh, might be directed to him. You've given me a great gift of a lot of time, and um, I've been given the great gift of uh, long-windedness, so I, I am going to... Um, follow along some written text in hopes of keeping myself relatively to time. <coughs> and so forgive me as I, as I do that. Let me begin by just saying the very beautiful word, grace. What a gift of a word, grace. What a gift of creator. Liberated by God's grace. And I really thank you for this very strong thematic topic. It has given me a great deal to reflect upon, especially as I recall the journey of the last six years of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I have been so honored to serve as a commissioner and to bear witness to a richer, deeper country than I have ever known before. I have to admit I was resistant to your topic at first, that theme, liberated by God's grace. At first read, I have to admit, it sounded to me possibly like a cop-out, a liberation, a freeing up. Was God's grace about letting me and all of us off the hook? There but for the grace of God go I. We've all heard that phrase. Perhaps some of us have used it. But sometimes I've heard it used, and what it really seems to mean is, thank God that isn't me. And thank God I'm over here and not over there. The work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has not been in any way about letting anyone off the hook. On the contrary, it has been about perpetual insistence that we are all in this together. That we, as a country, created the mess that defines the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians today and that we as a country and as its citizens have now got to step up to our responsibilities as a country, and especially to step up to our values as a country, to clean up that mess and to set things right. 
the TRC has been a direct challenge to us all to get uncomfortable. What is so liberating about that? Rather, my experience as a TRC commissioner teaches me that we will be guided by God's grace. Sometimes in little ways that seem incidental and, and even trite, and I hope this example that I'm about to share with you doesn't sound too trite, but I have learned, for me at least, that if we stay alert and with a listening heart, such little moments can serve to help us to take the next step, to try. So let me give you this one example. It was in the very early days of the commission, and I was scheduled to speak to a very big congregation of faith. It was not a faith tradition that was familiar to me, and in any case, I am no theologian. I'd be the first to say that. It was in one of our major cities, and I was very nervous. And we were still in the early stages of figuring out how exactly we were going to breathe life into this commission's mandate. So as I was preparing myself, as I say nervously for this, I saw this banner flying outside a church in the vicinity of where I was going to be speaking. And here's what it said. Extraordinary. Faith. Truth. Change. I read it several times. It just seemed so powerful to me and so timely and so perfect and so God-given. Extraordinary. Faith. Truth. Change. It served as a moment of grace, of being guided by God. No thanks to anything I had done or figured out, just a gift of spirit flying out there before me, combining the powerful words of faith, truth, and change, and guiding me later on to challenge that terrifyingly huge audience by saying this, we can live our faith through truth to achieve change. We can live our faith, our spiritual beliefs and values, however varied our traditions may be. And as a wise elder said to me a few years ago, there is no wrong way to pray. We can live our faith, our spiritual beliefs and values through truth, with all the courage, honesty, humility, and compassion that may take in order to change that which needs to be changed, positive change, and change which I see as a synonym for reconciliation, one of the many. For reconciliation at its heart is about change. Reconciliation, you well know this, it means many things to many people, it means many things at many different levels. But I have yet to meet anyone for whom reconciliation means everything stays the same. Reconciliation is about change. The banner proclaimed that if we were to do that, if we were to live our faith through truth to achieve change, it would be extraordinary. And it was interesting because the banner even had the word extraordinary in capital letters. The challenge I want to put to all of us today is how do we make that ordinary, not extraordinary? How do we normalize reconciliation in Canada? Not as a flavor of the month, as I once heard it expressed by a senior opinion leader in Ottawa, but rather as part of our normal, ordinary, Canadian way of living in respectful and truthful relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal citizens. Well, as you know, and that's why I'm here, that's why you're here as well, I'm sure, a lot of work has already been done over the past six years exploring this very question. How do we normalize reconciliation? And I want to take a few minutes now, with the benefit of a PowerPoint, to walk you through a summary of the work that is already now well underway. And you'll see as we go through it, that though I start wide, I have tried intentionally to zero in on where do you fit in all of that as a church and also as citizens. So let me begin with that. 
Well, there is a small point. Okay, I can see that. <laughs> I was thinking, how am I going to follow that? So, um, some of you may have come more recently to, to this, so I won't presume, and I will take a few minutes just to ground you properly. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission was not a government initiative. We ended up being set up by the government, but as a legal obligation on the government. It came about because it was a massive court case. It was brought about by the survivors of residential schools. There were residential schools in our country for almost 150,000 years, predating Confederation, in fact. And there was a lawsuit brought against the federal government and four national churches, the, the primary churches who ran those residential schools on contract to the federal government. And I know you've heard from Primate Fred Hiltz, and so you'll know from him and through other means that the Anglican Church was one of those, uh, the Catholic churches with several entities involved as well, the United Church of Canada and the Presbyterian Church in Canada. Those were the defendants in the court case. And those who brought the court case were the survivors and the national indigenous organizations, the Assembly of First Nations and the four regional Inuit homeland organizations through Inuit Tapari Kanatami. And of course, the survivors themselves through their own uh, legal counsel. And the settlement was a huge one. And one of the things that was hard fought, and we know this from those who were at the tables, was a condition that said there shall be a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There were monetary provisions. You probably know a little or a lot about that, the common experience payment, the abuse hearings that you <coughs> still hear talk about because that part is unfolding still, um, commemoration initiatives, community healing projects, but there also was the creation of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and its purpose in the broadest sense was educational so that we could we could address our own national ignorance about what had happened in residential schools under our noses for all these decades, that we could learn from it, that we could document it so that we would never again either forget or deny, and that we could learn the lessons so that we could stop doing things in wrong ways and start learning new things, new ways to do things better. So the TRC, we've always, it is an independent commission and we've always referred to it as the Survivors Commission. Uh, they wanted a forum because the courts were not going to provide it in an out-of-court settlement, a place to put their side of the story on the record. And that's what our TRC process has, has allowed for. So the agreement was settled in 2007. Our commissioners uh, began in 2009. Our chair, Justice Marie Sinclair, and my co-commissioner, Chief Wilton Littlechild, who is from Treaty 6 territory here, Musquatchie is not far from here. We launched, um, sort of re-announced ourselves, because it was a bit of a false start with the commission. We re-announced ourselves at an event called Witnessing the Future. We wanted that name to capture our intention of trying to imagine a new way of being. And you can see in the photo there, Michael Jean, who was the sitting governor general at the time, who was also inducted as our very first honorary witness. We were guided throughout our work by a survivors committee, and it's why I always make it my practice to acknowledge the survivors, and not only because they are the heroes of this story, they are also the authors of a huge part of this story and the history that we have rewritten and are rewriting for ourselves. Um, and, but they also were, in a way, the moral compass to keep us true to our mandate's purpose. What was it we were setting out to do? And here you see a picture, and you actually see Chief Littlechild in the hat in the front row. He was not originally on that survivors committee, but Mr. Raymond Arkand, I'm saying that for the benefit of those of you who may be from this region, he is from uh, Treaty 6 area and unfortunately passed away early on in our commission's work. So Chief Littlechild, who's also a survivor, um, sat in on the survivor committee in his stead. And we had an Inuit subcommission to make sure that we didn't lose track of the particular experience of the, uh, the Inuit whose schools began much later um, and whose on the land experiences were much more recent uh, than many parts of Southern Canada. We had, and these are just some num numerical things, it's, it's more what we did as opposed to what came out of that. We'll, we'll come to that, but as you can see, this tells you among other things that we're, we were very busy, but it also tells you um, that there's no part of Canada really that was left out of this and that we really did try to engage the whole country. 
Um, and I'm not going to repeat all of these numbers. But I do want to just say a word here um, and serve notice to my husband that this is going to be his cue to come up, um, that, um, that we received 7,000 statements from survivors. And they were not all survivors, by the way. Many were so-called intergenerational survivors, children and grandchildren of survivors who, who felt that as a result of the way their parents were raised, the kind of challenges that they had being raised in institutions, not knowing their languages, being raised often in contexts of abuse, of violence, um, uh, uh, being, um, not having a sense of being loved by anyone in particular, that those were all things that got transmitted to the next generation. And we also heard from many intergenerational survivors. And towards the end, we heard from many um, non-Indigenous people, a growing number, some from the churches um, and some from um, general society, wanting to be on the record with saying, I did not know any of this. I'm angry that no one ever taught me any of this. Now that I know, I want Canada to know that this is what I think about all of this. And so it, it was not just survivors, but they were the bulk of it and they were the heart of the, what is now a significant oral history. I'm not sure that there's ever been in Canada a canvas of grassroots opinion of 7,000 people, not just you know an opinion poll response, but actually giving voice to that many people to say what they think about significant uh, socioeconomic um, and, and cultural, spiritual issues um, in our country. Many of the people who spoke to us found that the way they could speak was not in words um, spoken in a big room, but through music or through dance or through art of various sorts. And some people did that instead and some people did both. And my husband is one of those who, uh, who did both. And so I'm going to let him... Um, say whatever it is he wishes to tell you about one of his songs, um, but it is representative in a way of some of the messages that we received from survivors and the story of the residential schools. Good morning and uh, thank you for um, allowing me to uh, be up here. I spent uh, about 10 years working as a leader for the Dene Nation in the Northwest Territories. And I spent 16 years in the Legislative Assembly, 12 years as a minister of different portfolios, and the last four as a premier. During the last six years, survivors of residential school many of whom were friends of mine that I grew up with, started to ask one another, what do you remember? What happened to you? I was a minister in government. There was no allowance for weakness. I rarely ever smiled showed emotion in the time I was in office. Still the question came, what do you remember? I was nine years old the first time I went. And to survive the things that happened to me, I, I guess as a nine-year-old, the only way I could was to say it didn't happen, to lock it away somewhere. And I was about 50 years old when I finally admitted that some things had happened to me. And it's like taking a scab off a wound deep inside it. It's a painful, difficult experience. And the moment it happened to me, I realized why students had committed suicide. So in any way, I, I, I wrote a song. I came from a log house as a child. I was 18 by 18. There was nine of us living in it. When I went to residential school, 
There were more people in that building than there was in my entire community. And there were hallways, doorways, storage rooms, dark places where terrible things happened. And like thousands of others, I locked it away. And uh, anyway, it came out in a form of a song. It took about 15 minutes to write the first four verses. It took me six months later to, uh, to conclude. As uh, my wife said, you can dive all you want, but you have to come back up sometime. So uh, we added a verse to it. So I have um, said many times over that there's nothing like hearing firsthand from survivors to get a sense of what the experience was. And you know, if I um, think about what happened at the national events listed here, 
and at the many community events. So many people said those experiences of attending them were transformative for them. Even those people who felt they knew a lot already about Indigenous issues, even about residential schools, but only and until they heard firsthand from residential school survivors did they really start to get it deeply, what had happened and the cost. And, and to, 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 to stop making easy comparisons between uh, boarding schools, private boarding schools or other such things where there was still a lifeline to parents and where uh, one could at least speak one's own language um, and all that sort of thing. Um, and be in one's own spiritual tradition and have friends and have siblings there. And none of those things were <laughs> allowed in any kind of a standard way in the residential school situation. We were very intentional, and I draw your attention to this, in our national events uh, to choose themes that rather than being a topic were rather um, value-based. And these particular values here are often referred to in the indigenous way as the, the seven sacred teachings or the seven grandfather teachings. That's not common to all indigenous nations in Canada, but from my own upbringing, I know that they are very, very common values to most faith traditions in the world. And so we, we wanted it to be a value-based conversation. As we said to the survivors at the beginning, this is a sacred trust you have given us. And this is spiritual work, and we needed to keep that um, in a mindful way. The attendance was all of these, and one of the things that was peculiar um, in a good way about our commission, and we know this from comparative analysis with uh, international colleagues, apparently we are the only truth commission in the world that has ever intentionally made outreach to youth through our targeted education days, part of um, our approach to our work. It's because we felt so strongly that it was education and the schools that um, basically nourished the loss, nourished the harms. And it's education and the schools that can play such a major role in nourishing the healing and the restoration and the reclamation of understanding and dignity. And so we, uh, you can see almost 15,000 students across the country. We are very happy to know that there is already one group that is pledging to take on the continuation of education days as part of their work going forward, knowing that there need to be many more of those. Um, and now, mentioning again honorary witnesses, uh, to underscore two things, I talked about Michael Jean at the beginning, our very first one, but this is a, a similar group of um, great dignitaries, and I don't know if you recognize all the faces, but we have in this midst here a former prime minister, we have a former Auditor General of Canada. We have a former head of the Human Rights Commissions of Canada. We have a former Indian Affairs Minister. Uh, we have a, a member of the Jewish Holocaust Association. We have a renowned national broadcaster. These are people of great influence, and their influence often is in spheres uh, and to populations who don't normally or have not historically associated automatically or easily with indigenous communities, and so have not been raised to be aware of some of these things or to even know each other as friends and as neighbors. And so their outreach, that ripple out effect of their pebbles in the pool of um, reconciliation will be hugely important and already has proven to be so. But I also want to say that these are some of the very people former Prime Minister, former Indian Affairs Minister, who said, I thought I knew a lot about all of this. I thought I knew a lot about all of this. And that's one thing that I'm so grateful for about our commission, is that we were able to create space, and, and I think we learned how to do that in a safe way, so that people could hear the voices they'd never heard before, and therefore deepen their own understanding of what had really happened, the enormity of it, as Stephen has so often said to me, the enormity of it. Imagine seven generations of investment in dysfunction, displacement, loss of sense of self and worth. That's a lot of investment in harm. So uh, documenting and remembering to capture what we've done, uh, just very quickly, uh, we've published things that are important, that are there for your reference, they're on our website. Many of you will have seen these, but there is a kind of summary version 
of the history of residential schools in a document called They Came for the Children, um, and also an interim report. We had 20 uh, preliminary uh, recommendations at that time, and if you were to read that comparatively now with what we've released a couple of weeks ago, you'll find that it builds on those early, it was kind of like early, um, early notice. Here's what's coming, so get your heads wrapped around it. That was the purpose of those interim recommendations. Um, commemoration, we um, had the honor of stewarding the distribution of $20 million in commemoration money. We didn't manage that, it wasn't within our coffers, but uh, we did have, with the Survivors Committee, the honor of, and the difficulty, I have to say, of arbitrating uh, which ones would have lasting commemorative educational and reconciliation value. Those were really the key criteria that we used. And many projects all over the country, some of you will have heard about, and perhaps some of you, if you're in Ottawa, will have had a chance to do a taste sample of the Royal Winnipeg Ballet. They created a commemorative ballet about residential schools, if you can imagine. Um, this is a time for unlikely bedfellows, and so let's mix ballet and residential schools. Imagine the courage behind that decision. And they've done it, and it's amazing and riveting. Um, that's just to give you one example, I mean, films and uh, um, pieces of art, a beautiful commemorative piece that is in this picture here called The Witness Blanket, which is touring the country. If you haven't had a chance to see it, you can get it to come to a community near you by getting in line with a request. Um, it's a very stirring um, um, uh, artistic wall in the sense of BC uh, Coast Salish tradition. And it's made of all kinds of fragments and pieces of the residential school story, including pieces of the schools themselves, bricks and doorknobs and doors and signage, and, all, and it's incredibly beautiful and moving. Uh, documentation, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, if you're familiar with our mandate, it talks about the National Research Center, and this is its new name. And it's, um, it's up and running in its uh, temporary home. It will have a new home over the coming probably several years of the big fundraising campaign, based in Winnipeg, but with virtual windows all over the country. So that's something that will serve us all, that we'll be able to access. That's where all the survivors' statements will be housed. It's where all the church archives, the government archives will be housed. And then under the topic of validation and conclusion, uh, we released three documents recently in Ottawa, um, basically as much as we could readily uh, release. One, the survivors speak, uh, which is fully a volume devoted to direct voice of survivors from coast to coast to coast. A sampling, obviously we can, couldn't put all the statements in there, but a sampling, a representative sampling that captures the, the various storylines uh, of what we heard. And then a document that we created called What We Have Learned, Principles of Reconciliation. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that in a moment. And then our TRC calls to action. So this is where now I want to get a bit more specific with you. The principles of reconciliation, uh, because I realize these documents are not widely, widely available yet, and some of you won't have had a chance to uh, see them on our website, but they're so foundational. And this is why I call it TRC conclusions. Our conclusions, first of all, was... Uh, were that if we're going to go forward, we have to go forward on a shared basis. What is the principled basis from which we will go forward? And so these are the things that we have identified. There are 10 of these, and you can read as well as I, but I'll, I'll just touch on them quickly because you may not have seen them before. But that the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples um, is a foundation for reconciliation. We don't have to create a whole new one. There's a perfectly good framework there. If you don't know that document, familiarize yourself with it. It has several clauses, and it's one of those things that if we could make it an active document and use it as a lens for policy making, for decision making, um, for our governments, of course, but possibly also for our churches, in your, certainly in your social justice campaigns, to use that as a, as a framework, it, it would be a good guide, I think. Um, that there are treaty, uh, constitutional and, and treaty rights. And, and when I'm speaking to faith communities, I like to say, you know, to remind us, treaties are covenants. That's the language we use in a spiritual context. There is a spiritual pledge that is made, just as with marriage. A marriage is a treaty, it is a contract, it is a covenant, and it has a spiritual underpinning. And it must be recognized and respected. Why should Canada have the right to break its own laws? Um, the, the process of healing relationships, it's not just about 
doing stuff. It's getting to know each other. It's healing relationships. And for many of us, that means, first of all, getting relationships, having some. Um, finding ways to meet each other and to be in the same rooms. Uh, that's one of the things that I think the commission showed us so well, how enriching it is to be in the same rooms and to meet each other um, in, a, um, in a level way uh, where all can be heard and respected. Um, action. This is not hand-wringing. It's not crying. We've all done both of those things in spades. Uh, probably many more tears to be shed. Uh, I never know when I'm doing a presentation whether it'll hit me before I'm done. And, but, but it isn't enough, is my point. It needs action, and we need to think about what to do. We've tried to think hard about that and offer you some suggestions in our calls to action. We don't pretend for one second that that's an exhaustive list. It's a springboard list where other ideas will, will flow. Um, that we, uh, why are we doing it? Because we have glaring, dramatic, horrific statistics that tell us we're not a very fair society. We're not a very fair society, and guess who's at the bottom all the time, or at the top, depending on what we're measuring. If it's incarceration, it's one, you know, you're at the top. If it's poverty, you're at the top. If it's access to education and health services, you're at the bottom. And I'm talking about the Indigenous peoples. And this is not, um, this is not, um, um, in the spirit of, uh, there's a perfectly good phrase that's just escaping right now. It's, it's, this is not in the spirit of do-gooderism. That's what I wanted to say. It's in the spirit of actual facts, facing the facts before us. Um, that we are all treaty peoples. And again, often I go back to the measurement of marriage. One person doesn't get married. Right? I mean, you can't say you're married. Nothing says, well, I'm not. Um, in fact, I heard something, perhaps you saw this, uh, very, uh, very provocative. I, I, I saw something the other day, it was attributed to Bob Ray, and I didn't hear it firsthand, the Honorable Bob Ray, who said that um, Aboriginal people um, are, are trying to figure out um, how to make a marriage work. And very often governments are trying to figure out what are the terms of the divorce. It's a very different frame from which to uh, consider dialogue. And so just to think about that. But with that come responsibilities, of course. And uh, anyway, uh, that Aboriginal elders and knowledge keepers have concepts and practices of reconciliation. I was just talking with Jennifer Kairos just before we began here, this very notion, the concepts of reconciliation and the deep and rich notions of what that is. Um, I know I've shared one of them um, from time to time, the sense that uh, reconciliation Back home, one of our linguistic friends, and Stephen's going to correct me because I'm going to say it incorrectly, but something close to Raquel Relezzi Dusing, she says it means becoming two again, not one instead of the other, not one on top of the other, not one better than the other, but becoming two again. Uh, so that's one interesting way to think about it. Um, and then cultural revitalization is essential to the reconciliation process. You know why? Because among other things, it's directly tied to healing and well-being. And we pay a huge societal cost for the lack of healing and the lack of well-being. We pay for it in every measurable statistic. So many survivors who came before us said the key to their healing, having tried umpteen different things, including in and out of various churches, was being able to reclaim their cultural identity, a sense of belonging, a sense of who am I, I belong. I am, I am of creator and I was made just the way I was supposed to be made. I wasn't supposed to be fixed by somebody else and turned into something else. And then the last two, need for political will. And I'm gonna to touch on that later because political will comes from <coughs> us. It comes from you. It comes from you guys and the people you influence and the people who live beside you and the people who never set foot in your church but whom you know and you associate with. In a democracy, that's how it's supposed to work, right? Political will comes from us. And we have to stop allowing governments to act as if they're the boss of us. And we have to say, here's what we expect you to do for us. This is what we want for us. And so joint leadership is assuming our part of that joint leadership. Um, and then, of course, it takes the investment of resources, and that's a hot political issue, because there's, 
you know, back home we would say, you know, we've got the 17th dog scrapping after the same bone. Everybody wants a piece of what seems to be ever reducing resources. But we've got to be courageous in our prioritization. There's the have and the have nots, and then there's the really have nots. And, and if our faith tells us anything, it says that we're supposed to be living and sharing in kindness. And so we have to advocate for where resources are needed. And then we need sustained public education, because you know what? 7,000 statements, 150,000 people, 15,000, that's a lot of people took part in the TRC, but way more never made it into any of those rooms. And curriculum development is happening in many schools, but in many schools don't yet have anything other than what they've always had. There are people, I can assure you to this day, um, and, and I mean, I'm relatively high profile in the work of the commission, other people who are just talking about the commission are not necessarily so high profile as I have been given the privilege of being. Um, people say, well, what's, what's that? Never heard of that. Never heard of that. I mean, I never know whether to cry or weep <laughs> when I hear that, but I, you just have to keep trying, right? So anyway, our, so from those conclusions, which are principled conclusions, um, come, came our final report and calls to action. The final report with its multiple volumes and tonnage of, of words, um, which probably most of you will never lay eyes on, um, is going to be ready in December. And these are the broad categories of what's in there. And it's one to, so there'll be a big, more elongated piece about the history of the schools. Um, there is going to be a piece about the missing children. And I think you have all heard we know for certain that there are more than 3,200 children who never return from the schools. And sometimes you hear the number 6,000, and that's because there are so many records that we have not yet had a chance to cross-reference. And we want to make sure we're not double-counting people, because sometimes children will be entered but no name attached. Or um, there will be a last name but no first name, so you don't know if that's the same one from some other record or a different child. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done to carefully um, assess that. Anyway, the survivors speak, which was already re-released, but that's a really important um, and will be a standing part of our final report. And then the school legacy issues. So this is the part when I talked at the very beginning, kind of the mess we've created. These are the areas where a real work needs to be done, remedial work, remedial learning and remedial action to clean up. And then there's an, in each of these categories, including spirituality, note that. It's important for you to know and understand that many people came to us and talked about, yes, sexual abuse, yes, physical abuse, yes, psychological abuse, but also many, many talked about spiritual abuse. That they had already a notion of the creator and had been taught that before they came to school. And everything that they were taught was, was uh, castigated, was, taught to, was told to be uh, of the devil. So spiritual abuse is what we've heard about, and we have to look at that um, as a legacy issue as well. And then uh, reconciliation. What is, what, what is the clean slate that has been given to us? The, 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 what is the blank page that has been given to us to say, create something beautiful? What will that look like? So I've, there are 94 um, calls to action, and I was speaking to Prime Minister Hiltz just before, and um, very, great, very grateful to him in many ways for the leadership that he's shown on this front as a very um, um, determined and vocal representative of the all parties. But also, um, he told me that he said, you know, all 94 have implications for you, and I really thank him for that, because I think that's true for all of us. But there are certain ones that are specific, and I've taken the liberty of saying for the Lutheran Church, uh, because um, there are a couple of areas where it isn't just about the parties to the settlement agreement. So this one in particular, you see where I've bolded there? It says, we call upon the church parties to the settlement agreement. So Primate Hiltz and the others that I've named, the Catholics and United and the Presbyterian, um, and all other faith groups and interfaith social justice groups in Canada who have not already done so. So that's a pretty wide door. Um, that we're, at, we're calling on you to formally adopt and comply with the principles, norms, and standards of the UN Declaration. So that first principle of reconciliation that I talked about, we're calling on you to do that in a formalized way. And what does that really mean? And I'm, I'm not going to read all of this <coughs> p 
page here. Uh, I'll, I'll make um, this PowerPoint available to you so you can reference it, um, Bishop Susan, if that's okay. Um, but it's, it's, it's acknowledging, I put the actual words here on here for you, so it's, that's why there, there are so many of them. Um, but it's, it's not exactly easy for PowerPointing. Um, but it's really uh, about um, looking at uh, compliance with the UN Declaration, um, acknowledging uh, right to self-determination, including in spiritual matters, you'll see that. Um, ensuring on ongoing public dialogue, and here you're doing that. You're doing that already, and, and thank you so much for that. Um, and then, but there's a very particular one at the bottom. You see that? In issuing a statement no, ma no later than March of next year. That's uh, nine months from now. Um, as to how you will implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So I don't know if that can fit into the frame of what you're doing here, but there's a specific thing that you're being asked to do in, in whatever preliminary way you're able to do it. It would be an incredibly important signal, I think. Then there is the Royal Proclamation and Covenant, Covenant of Reconciliation. And uh, I want you to know I had something to say about the use of the word covenant there, because I think it's, it is such an important, spiritually grounded word. Um, to jointly develop with Aboriginal peoples a royal proclamation of reconciliation. And this would build on the Royal Proclamation of 1763 and the Treaty of Niagara. These are foundational documents for Canada that predate um, Confederation. And they affirm the nation-to-nation -nation relationship. And so uh, I, I mention this to you because these are things that go back to what I was saying earlier about giving direction to the government and to all those political parties that are going to be, and candidates that are going to be seeking your vote, ask them what their intention is on some of these specific calls. Um, and so this has to do, and I know you're going to be talking about it, I think, at your forum, the Doctrine of Discovery and uh, Primate Hiltz's. Um, here, I know we'll be able to help with that because they've already been through it in their church. Um, but also uh, the issue of treaty relationships. Um, uh, well, anyway, you see these for what they are, and I'm not going to, as I say, read them all. But they are specific things that you can speak to and become familiar with, with the language and the terms, so that you can be strong advocates in the context of, uh, of speaking to your elected leadership. And then to sign, uh, all parties of the settlement agreement, to sign a covenant of reconciliation to reaffirm the party's commitment to reconciliation, which, by the way, um, the parties of the settlement agreement have already said that, and they issued an important statement together at our closing event in Ottawa, and that, you know, you can already check this one off in a way. That's already happened. But look at that last one, enabling additional parties to <coughs> sign on to the covenant of reconciliation. So additional parties can be governments, provincial governments, but it could also be other churches. It could be your church. You could think about that and say, is that something that would be a good action for us and that we would want to do? This one, and I, I'm telling you about this one because, um, and you'll see I've changed the heading there, calls to action for Lutheran citizens. So this is not just so much as a church, but as citizens, in fact, the previous one as well. But we call upon the Parliament of Canada to enact legislation to establish a National Council for Reconciliation. I really don't want this number 53 uh, to get lost in the, and I, I must admit, I personally wish that we had reordered them somewhat, but they are how they are, and we'll, we'll see whether that changes in the end. <coughs> because I don't want this one to get buried, because it is, it is, in a way, the action call for making sure there's action on all the other calls. It's to have a national council that would be an oversight body, that would, that would be there, first of all, to... Um, to say, are we implementing these calls to action that are based on so much and such a long public process of consultation as was the TRC? But also, are things getting any better? Can we start measuring the gap and is it getting narrower in all those ways? And so, um, and again, I'm not gonna go over all that, but that's what it's about. It's a group that would be kind of a watchdog um, that would have the right to, it would be independent of government and that would report back to government. And, um, and then these are, re they flow from it. It, it, needs, it needs resources in order to be able to do that, to call on provinces, for example, to say, give us your latest child welfare stats. We do not have national records of these things now. We have still so many blind spots about ourselves. 
um, but also the Prime Minister to take it seriously, uh, the head of our most um, prominent national government, whoever that is, going forward, to make it a priority to report on this to the people of Canada, um, to say, here's the state of things. Are we there yet? Are we getting better? Is it getting worse? Now what do we do? So in short, reconciliation will require the leadership and lived values of all people of faith. And it will also require the sustained efforts of both the faithful. This is not a time to look inward. We all know there's not a church in the country. Yours may be the exception, I don't know, but there are so many churches in the country who have fewer and fewer in their pews. So we can't just rely on who's inward. We have to look outward, and that's why I note um, of the faithful and secular society working together as citizens. We don't just wear the church hat. We also wear the citizen hat and probably many other hats which are important for influencing others. Uh, all committed to the ongoing process of reconciliation. So um, it's my practice and I would like to do that now. And an, I just have a, a very brief closing remark, but I would like to give the last word on this. To summarize that journey in a way, the spiritual journey that we've been on, uh, give voice to the survivors. And so I would ask our, our technical supports there if you would please pay, play the, uh, the video. Um, and this is from the Alberta National Event. Uh, it was our summary video. Some of you may have been here, and if not, I think you'll experience it the way we all do. very first time I talked about the residential <coughs> school, I said it was just like I had these skeleton keys and I went through a door in my mind and I would go to each door and I would open them and this, this one was fear and this one was low self-esteem. And this one was sexual abuse. And the list goes on and on and on. I remember the loneliness, the crying, <coughs> and being witness to all the abuse around me. I feel like I've been dropped from the sky. Nobody around me, strangers around me. They don't know us, I don't know them. I don't know how to socialize. I don't, I don't even know how to love. I went through sexual abuse. I went through physical abuse. Mental, spiritual. And I'll tell you, the one thing that we suffer the most is the mental and spiritual abuse that we carry in the rest of our lives. My mother and father had 13 children and every single one of us had gone to residential school. I long for the smell of spruce boughs and of the smoke, wood smoke. I long for the taste of the dried meat and the dried fish. I was hungry for all of that time for my own food. And there was such a longing in my heart, such a loneliness for my people. This individual, this perpetrator of mine, this is what the individual first heard when he was talking to me. I said, I'm sorry. I said, I'm sorry because for the last 50 years, I've hated you and I've wanted to kill you. That came from me. But that wasn't me speaking. That was that seven, eight, nine-year-old boy getting out whatever was still bothering him after 60, 65 years. My youngest brother, his name, Michael Antoine, is 12 years old. And my mom and I were together and we got a call. He's in the hospital. He was in residential school. I wasn't by that. I walked into the hospital and he was black and blue. I was never so shocked in all of my life. And then a few days later, 
we got a call. We're still in the city, my mother and I, and we got a call at night and they said he passed. It's about us, it's about my brother, it's about the children that never came back. By forgiving the church, by forgiving the abusers, and not carrying all of that garbage with us wherever we go, we invest in our own healing. People ask me, what do you expect to achieve? The answer is freedom. I am free. Forgiveness is not for the weak. When you forgive, you grow, you heal, but most of all, you free your heart and you free yourself of anger, grief, blame, shame, guilt, because anger is a spiritual sickness. But when you forgive, you actually live. I'm proud to say that I opened those doors and I forgave. Our failures fill us with deep regret. But as we know, regret and apology is not enough. The test of that regret and that apology we know will be our actions in the days ahead. We are in the midst of a long and painful journey as we reflect on the cries that we did not or would not hear and how we have behaved as a church. We travel this difficult road of repentance, reconciliation and healing we commit ourselves to work towards ensuring that we will never again use our power as a church to hurt others with attitudes of racial and spiritual superiority. The commission chair, the eloquent Mr. Justice Sinclair, borrows a phrase that was used by the leaders of the American Civil Rights Movement. That phrase is, keep your eye on the prize. <coughs> that sets a challenge for all of us, indigenous and non-indigenous, commissioners and citizens. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission will help define the prize. We as Canadians, as citizens, have to mobilize the eyes and help the larger Canadian population both see and act. Reconciliation in this context means coming together as a whole, with one purpose being to hear and to heal, and then a critical common purpose, which is to move forward together. And if we fail to do that, if we fail to go beyond apology and regret, if we admit the truth and ignore the reconciliation, that would be to repeat the pro profound offenses of the residential schools themselves. I believe that Canada, as a broad and generous country, could find the will to repair the damage of that past and build new partnerships if enough of our citizens know and if their eyes are turned to the prize. So there may be no need to say more, but just allow me uh, to wrap up with one seemingly trite example of God's grace in our midst. You know, as I was preparing my reflection for you 
uh, tired in yet another hotel room, I got a sudden glaring message on my computer screen. And I have a complicated computer, and I am not a computer whiz. I have a Mac machine, but it runs Windows software, which is where I mostly function. And the two systems talk to each other by some interface, apparently called Unity. So here's the message I got. Can't find Unity. I read that and I had a moment of panic. <coughs> and I immediately thought, of course, about you and whether or not I would be able to pull together the completion of my thoughts and composing what I wanted to offer you. But just as quickly, and this is what I would call a flash of grace, of everyday grace, I thought about the big work before all of us as a country. And it prompted me to keep trying. And guess what? I found unity. I have no idea what it means, and I'm not really sure how I found it. And all I know is that I just kept trying. Some things worked, and some things didn't. And eventually, I found my way back to where I was trying to go. And you know, it has been that way for me countless times, countless times in my days as a commissioner because we've been involved in unprecedented and uncharted work. So let me go right back to your theme. I think the liberation offered by God's grace at this time in our country's history is not our own. It is the liberation of grace manifested as courage and resilience in the survivors of the residential school students. They are the ones who fought for ongoing reconciliation with all the people of Canada. They are the ones who wrote that word. They are the ones who wrote us into the mandate of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And they fought so hard through the courts to get this TRC in the face of res resistance from Canada and from some of the churches who did not want these truths to be so widely told and so widely known. So it's through the survivors' own indigenous, God-given spiritual understandings that we have all been invited by them into a second chance of getting things right with the first peoples of these many homelands in the country we now call, by one of their own words, Kanata, Canada. So let us think deeply with our hearts as we head into the festive season of the 2017 celebrations of the 150th anniversary of Canada. Let me ask us these questions. Will we be ready to inherit the courage and the resilience of the survivors? Will we be ready to reconstitute our notions of our country in real and measurable ways? Will we keep the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation <coughs> Commission alive and worked actively to see them implemented? Will we allow ourselves to be guided and so liberated by God's grace? Thank you very much.